We are on to the next session now. So we're going to hear all about volunteering for wellbeing. So I'm going to hand over to Helen and she can introduce herself and then we'll get going. Thanks, Helen. Okay, welcome. Thank you um, so much for inviting us to speak today. Uh, my name is Helen Mason. I'm an occupational therapist and advanced sensory integration therapist. And I'm currently a student of EMDR training as well. Um, and I run a social enterprise called The Shed at Powdon Castle. And I'm so honoured um, today to be <laughs> sitting next to Nina Parnell, who is just the most incredible woman. <laughs> She's the head of volunteering at West Bank Charity. Um, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about volunteering in health um, and uh, the work that Nina and I have collectively been doing um, in partnership with the castle as well. Um, I just want to um, say that today I will be talking about um, child abuse um, as part of this presentation, which may be triggering for some people. Um, I would um, recommend um, seeking support if something does trigger for you, um, via Samaritans or um, through your uh, usual networks, or you can also email me for support too. Um, and also, if, if something triggers for you and you wish to leave, um, you're very welcome to, and then email me afterwards. Okay, so. So volunteering is amazing. <laughs> um, it can help your mental health um, by sharing your passion. Um, it can physically get you out and moving and doing things. And it can be an amazing social experience as well. So meeting with, with other people, connecting and doing something really wonderful for other people. Um, and that can actually be really amazing for ourselves and our, and our own health. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, and here is a few stats about volunteering. Um, so 80% um, of the people who volunteered in the last year, this is um, health, um, from Health Benefits from, um, Volunteering website, um, said they felt they had control over their health, which I think is wonderful. 94% uh, of people who volunteered say that volunteering improves their mood. And certainly as... Um, I was uh, pregnant when the pandemic started and then I had my baby um, in lockdown and certainly volunteering for West Bank has been an incredible experience for me and really helped with my health. So um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, practitioners uh, volunteering um, and how that can be um, helpful for well-being um, and also supporting our amazing community projects that are around in the community. So the other thing I'd like to say about um, volunteering is that actually clinically, we know that it can be helpful for post-traumatic growth. So uh, trauma therapies, for example, trauma-focused CBT um, and some cognitive behavioral um, therapy approaches will um, advise doing things like volunteering at the end of treatment to help build self-esteem. And it can, it, it, it clinically can be wonderful as well um, if we can support our clients in um, having those wonderful positive experiences and giving back. So I'm gonna see if I can move my screen down here. So there's a range of evidence. Uh, so this is from a um, uh, article um, that was published in 2020 on the mental health benefits of community helping during the crisis. Uh, coordinated helping, community identification, and sense of unity during COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and in this article, um, they say that a range of evidence suggests that helping behaviours have a positive impact on health and well-being. Longitudinal and cross-cultural studies show volunteering results in increased happiness, reduced depression, and better well-being, as well as being valuable to vulnerable groups such as refugees. So I'm not going to read the whole of this screen um, because this is recorded. You can stop and, and watch it later if you would like to. Um, however, I would recommend um, reading the article because it's actually a really interesting read um, and opened my eyes to things that I didn't know. So um, yeah, there's some information for you there. Uh, Gray in 2019 published a paper on how can we help 
exploring the role of shared social identity in the experiences and benefits of volunteering. Um, and from this article, um, Gray identified that group identities are fundamental to volunteers' motivations and experiences of volunteering. Sharing an identity with other volunteers promoted feelings of belonging, which in turn impacted on the participants' well-being. Identity processes also underpinned interactions with the beneficiaries of help and how volunteers managed the uh, challenges of helping. So again, I'm not going to go through all, all of the uh, information from the paper, but I, I would just like to say as somebody who has volunteered, um, it, it has some really brilliant, um, excellent, um, excellent outcomes for people and actually the and I think what the, is interesting about this slide is the actual identity of being a volunteer and the wonderful thing about West Bank and I wasn't going to tell you this little gem but I'm going to bring it out a bit early mm -hmm. West Bank has won the Queen's Award for um, volunteering mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you want to show it Nina oh right <laughs> it's a good one <laughs> Yes, so we've been presented with this amazing award um, by the Lord Lieutenant of Devon for some pretty amazing work that our volunteers helped us to do throughout the pandemic when we supported uh, the NHS um, as patients were being discharged from hospital. But I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But as you can see, I mean, that's just incredible, isn't it? Absolutely incredible. And um, as a volunteer for West Bank, it has been lovely connecting with the other volunteers, that sense of identity, um, supporting each other, really, and, um, and learning from each other. So it, it's also uh, volunteering can be a really amazing learning experience, too. Um, so thank you, Nina. So a little bit about how all of this started and how a uh, occupational therapist on maternity ended up working with head of volunteering at, at the, well, quite an incredible charity. Um, and also um, at a castle with llamas. And I've, I've put the llama in here because Jade um, from the Institute of Health and Social Care Management loves our llamas. And I think... Um, Julie does as well, who's on the call today. Um, I say our llamas, it's actually um, the Countess and Earl of Devon's llamas, um, and we do walk them. <laughs> and um, the walled garden, which has llamas and horses and goats, goat walking is quite common, and lambs and lots of different animals, including amazing tortoises, uh, traditionally have offered opportunities for healthcare staff to come on their days off and walk the animals as a way of relaxing. Um, we uh, Currently in the wall garden, there's also a pilot that comes to de-stress and take the llamas out, which is very interesting because llamas are actually very um, feisty and they don't really like to be walked. So <laughs> um, yeah, so um, it's a challenge and that in itself is quite interesting. So um, the castle has got a history of um, supporting um, the community in that way. Um, in May 2020, I wrote a poem, which I'm about to read to you. It's quite a difficult poem to read and to hear. Um, I wrote it in the middle of the night. Um, there was a lot of media at the time. Um, sorry, my, my clinical background and the where, where I was working at, the at that particular time was in CAMS. Um, and I had just transferred uh, from the child sexual abuse team um, to the autism team. So I had been working in, in child abuse um, and it really came to me. And I'm just going to, to read this poem to you. It's called The Silenced, Ode to Lockdown Children. Here's to the silenced ones, the beaten ones, the shut up and never be seen ones. Here's to the invisible ones, didn't mean to ones, could do no right, try not to be seen ones. Here's to the shamed ones, guilt-ridden, blamed ones, the it's your our secret from your mum ones. Here's to the no school, no break ones, no hope for an end ones, the dream of death, already dead ones. Here's to the hungry, frightened, hidden, no clap for me ones, true heroes, the nameless COVID-19, just about surviving ones. Here's to the silence. Just 
just a couple of moments just to um, think of those children that have been affected, some of them sadly not with us anymore, and to our colleagues in the police and health and social care who have done so much to try and support. And it's from that context really that, that this project and, and set of events grew. Um, I decided I uh, lost a baby uh, years and years ago, about 15 years ago. And when I was in lockdown, I also became very aware of mums who will have had stillbirth and won't have been able to have their family around them um, when the baby was born. So the trauma side. Um, I was very lucky when I lost my baby because um, I knew my dad was outside. He never came in, but I, we were allowed to have as many families as we wanted, whatever we wanted. Um, so I wanted to do something for the SANS charity that supports um, stillbirth and miscarriage. Um, and even though I'm not a runner, and I'm definitely not a runner, um, I decided to run 50 miles for SANS. Um, so I set off. Didn't <laughs> Luckily, um, um, the Earl of Devon um, lives near to us and he saw me running in the village and he said I will join you <laughs> for some of the runs and um, it's exactly 5k if you run over the deer park which isn't allowed um, but it's his deer park so we would run over the deer park um, together um, as part of my exercise hours during lockdown um, and during those runs and connecting, I mean, um, my history with the castle, I have supported children who, a child that comes down to uh, Torbay Holiday Helpers Network, which is another charity um, to have a holiday before, you know, with, with terminal illness. Um, and the castle has always supported my work supporting that charity. So we have had opportunities in the past to connect with our, my volunteering and their volunteering work so I had a bit of the history there anyway and I said to him I would love to do something for mums um, because actually I think I'd um, only seen one health visitor since my baby was born and I felt really isolated and I was very worried about other mums. Um, so when I achieved my 50 miles, I put a post on our local Facebook um, for the village to say this is really worried. This really worries me, and I'm also worried about mums who might be experiencing postnatal depression. And uh, what was wonderful is Charlotte put a note. Uh, we we'll hear about Charlotte in a moment, um, saying actually I'm really struggling, and I, and I would like some help. So um, at this point, I'd already connected with Nina because. Um, I was worried. So um, I said to her, is there anything we can do to, you know, anything I can do in my capacity with my baby to do something to support other people? And um, Nina very kindly said yes. So we set up the mum's walking group. Um, Charlotte put the shout out. I said to Nina, can I do this? And she said yes. So I put, uh, do you remember? Mm. I don't know whether Nina will always say yes to me anymore, actually, because <laughs> I, I put an advert out and within a few hours, we had hours. 60, yeah, two hours, we had 60 responses. Unfortunately, that was in the evening. So I spent most of the evening responding to all of these things and then see seeing in Nina, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, 60 responses. In <laughs> yeah. Amazing having volunteers. It can be a bit challenging yeah. sometimes as well. It certainly can. It certainly can. <laughs> yeah, so we we set up the, this group and um, it has been incredible. Um, here we are. This is um, some of the mums. Obviously, because we were in lockdown, we um, could only walk in groups of six. So at one point we were doing four, four walks a week. Um, and uh, current, actually the last couple of months, we've managed to merge the groups finally. But um, yeah, it, it's been a, a long period of doing lots of walks in the week. Um, and the feedback has been um, amazing. Um, just uh, This is just from one of them. The, the ladies that walk with us. Um, it's built my confidence coming into the mums group at the castle. I look forward to it every week, getting fresh air and having a chat. 
Um, my little one absolutely loves being outdoors, so it's perfect for her. There's only ever support and no judgment from others. Thank you for allowing me to join as my mental health has definitely improved since joining. That's from one of the mums. And you can see, and this is the shed um, that, uh, I, that is now, has now turned into a social enterprise. So that's actually in the grounds of the castle and we work in partnership with West Bank. Um, and I'd just like to play a little bit of a film to enable you to have a bit of a flavor about the, the charity here. There are so many ways to stay connected from meeting friends in the cafe to chatting on social media. But if you've got nobody to talk to, life can be very lonely. There's so much loneliness out there. There's so much need. What are the effects of loneliness? What are the dangers of loneliness? Research shows that loneliness is as bad for you as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It's worse than obesity. I wanted to find ways that we as a charity could reach out and help people like this. Loneliness can surface out of the blue. I'm nothing, am I? I've been had a problem. Head goes, I can't talk properly. A stroke robbed Vic Johns of more than an active life. He finds talking hard. Now he's got a pal forever in gear, a West Bank volunteer. Gear is the highlight of Vic's week. He looks forward to him coming. They try sort of speech therapy after the stroke, and that's all very well. Then somebody comes in and shows a picture and says, you try and say this word. It actually just frustrates somebody even more with aphasia. So Gear comes, and they just relax together. In the stunders, you can talk of what I used to do, and it helps me. I actually use... I really do can talk properly much better. Yeah, that's great. You're not called anything? Uh, but visits from gear help Claire too. I think when you're actually in the dark bits, it's hard to think that it, it is ever going to change. You have faith that things will be bearable, but it's become more than bearable. He's absolutely incredible, man. I love him. I love him. <laughs> Likewise, yeah. Yeah, we do, mate. We do it beautifully. Anyone, old or young, can feel isolated and alone at times. West Bank's campaign to end loneliness aims to reach out to all age groups. As much as I love Catherine, it, it can be lonely oh, just yeah. being you and a baby in four walls. Getting together with other new mums at Powderham Castle is helping Charlotte out of postnatal depression. Her baby was born during the pandemic lockdown. The normal support network just wasn't there. You can all look all lovely, nice new baby, and it's everything that you've sort of dreamed of and everything, but there are times when it's really, really difficult, and coming along to something like this and meeting other women that you can talk to, and, um, you know, they might be going through exactly the same thing, and they can make you realise that actually it is completely normal. You're not a bad mum. The challenge. So, as, as I said, absolutely incredible what you're doing, Nina, and, and the way you do it, and the way you grow things and support our community. So, thank, thank you, you so thank much. Thank you. These are some images from our walking group. Um, another thing that West Bank um, supported us uh, with doing this year is um, connecting with the University of Western England. Um, so we had two students mm -hmm. come, two occupational therapy students for their second and third year placements um, in the autumn to winter uh, of last year. Um, they, the, the pandemic has hit people in so many different ways and so many levels. Um, they didn't have placements. There's been a lot of problems having placements for um, 
healthcare staff and professional uh, students. Um, so it was wonderful to be able to, to offer that at a time where a lot of placements were shutting down. Um, yeah, so um, thank you, Nina, for yeah. facilitating that work that we, we did mm -hmm. together there as well. Um, this is actually um, the Go Wild Festival. So um, I continue my volunteering via the sheds at the castle um, that I have worked with historically um, before as well. And this um, was a family who um, dad took his own life during lockdown. And so mum and her daughter came to the festival and I facilitated them for the three days um, to, to have a holiday. Um, I've actually got some feedback um, from there. Sorry, <laughs> there's too many, too much feedback. Um, ah, here we go. It was great mental health support for my child and I to get out and socialise in such a fun way. It was also good support for me after such a tumultuous year to get out in a structured way and to engage with very as various aspects of the community. So that was um, from mum. So the shared um, social enterprise, we support healthcare practitioners um, from NHS, social care. Um, we also extend out to the police and fire services to come and have peer support at the castle. It's very relaxed. Um, peer support, um, but it enables people to come um, when they're sick or when they need some, some time to uh, relax. We have rewilding sessions, which um, where we do formal relaxation. Um, otherwise, we have we discuss what would be supportive for them at that time, and, and we offer things like art sessions and walking. Um, so um, this year we are putting on a national retreat called the Rewild Health Retreat. And this is for healthcare leads um, across um, health and social care to come together to think about what's, what's really important. So the first day is more of a conference style day uh, where we have um, people coming and talking from all sorts of walks of life. From um, we have uh, the lovely Ivy, who you've probably seen, uh, who is a, a dentist, who is also a poet, who is incredible. Uh, we have a GP who specialises in functional medicine to come and talk about diet, um, um, and a lady from the Maudsley Clinic who works with eating disorders, um, as well as artists. Um, and then the second day is about networking and bringing people together and innovation. And we're going to be doing things like yoga and meditation and really looking after ourselves and our bodies and making those, those connections, um, which can create opportunities for new innovations. So we are looking to connect also with digital companies who um, are looking at innovative new ways to support us, um, our work in, in health and social care. Um, so I would just like to speak a little bit to Nina, because um, you've heard me speak a lot, um, to hear a little bit more about your charity and and the Queen's Award. Okay. So, well, well, first of can all, you tell us about the Queen's yeah. Award? Of course I can. First of all, I'd like to say thank you to Helen for inviting me this morning and for her many kind words. I'm not sure they're all justified, but thank you anyway, Helen. Um, I really would just like to sort of reiterate some of what Helen has been talking about, about the, the, the many benefits of volunteering um, and to have a little chat about our Queen's Awards. So as a charity, uh, we support, uh, we have a really good working relationship with our local hospital at the RDE, and we have a service, a neighbourhood friends service, where we support uh, our volunteers with about 150 volunteers who support uh, patients who've been discharged from hospital that are without family and friends to help them onto their onward journey. It's really an amazing service, uh, one that works very well and is a really great example of integrated uh, social care where we're all working in partnership. It's, it's probably one of the best that I've ever worked in. Um, and obviously lockdown came along. We, we 
we deliver something like 50 cases a week where we're supporting people uh, from discharge, um, which helps with patient flow through the hospital, all things like that. And when the pandemic came along, I was really fearful that we wouldn't be able to continue to uh, deliver the service because uh, the majority of our volunteers are probably over the age of 70, certainly getting in their 60s and 70s, and many of which were, of course, having to shield. Um, but I needn't to have worried because what happened was, that, uh, although many of them stepped down, uh, within a week we put a shout out to our local community and we got 236 volunteers within one week coming forward to support not just our neighbourhood friends service, but um, to support those in need within, within our community. And it's just really, to, it's just a perfect example of what Helen has been talking about is that, so for many of these uh, vol new volunteers or community supporters, they were people uh, in work that were either furloughed or were having to work from home and facing all sorts of new challenges themselves. So that although they were fit and well, they actually were having to face and adjust to those new challenges. So enabling them to support our charity in a volunteering capacity um, helped the community, but it, it, volunteering is most definitely a two-way thing. So as much as they supported us, to support the NHS, to ease demand in that way, we supported them by um, giving them a sense of well-being and a sense of purpose, a sense of structure to their lives. So it, it was it was a, an extremely challenging time. It was actually the best of times as well. It was such a great working experience for us to be able to rise to those challenge and to continue to deliver the service uh, for which we won the Queen's Award because, you know, whilst most people were shying away from going to the hospital, here were our amazing volunteers who didn't even question why, well, why wouldn't I go? So supported in the right way with the right PPE equipment, et cetera, et cetera. We kept the service going and actually saw 43% rise in cases. Um, so that's where the Queen's Award came about and it was a very pro proud moment for the charity, I have to say. Sorry, I've probably gone on far too much there. Nina, you haven't. You've answered the question. But I would just like to say that if anyone has any interest in volunteering, I mean, as health professionals, quite often we are so busy. Um, I was speaking to a health professional the other day that comes down to the... Um, to the castle um, to do some volunteering. And um, she said to me, the thing is sometimes in my job nowadays, it's so acute now, we're dealing with things so it's so pressured the whole time. Don't feel like I can do things, I don't feel like I'm helping. Whereas when I come to volunteer, all that pressure is taken off me and I can, I can care for the goats. I can help people in that. Yeah, so it, it, it actually can be really good, even for healthcare professionals where you think, oh, giving more, is that such a good idea? But actually it's about understanding how we support people to volunteer in a safe way and, and in a way that means something to them and will help with their health. So as an occupational therapist that, you know, is my bread and butter, what is it? What is meaningful? What is gonna be helpful with your roles, your routines, that meaning in life? How can we support people to be the best people that they want to be in their way and um, certainly I've been so incredibly impressed with West Bank which is why I volunteer for them and um, also the generosity of the castle in allowing me to come on board um, and to work in partnership with both the castle and 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 West Bank is a dream really so um, yes so if you're thinking about volunteering then you can always contact myself or Nina or, you know, I'm always very ha happy to talk to professionals who may be interested in volunteering in their local area and working out how, how to do that so it works for them. Um, and that's not just in recovery, it's very helpful for people who are in recovery, but it's also helpful generally anyway for our, for our health. So, and uh, goodness me, there's quite a lot of cracks. So there's a lot of, uh, things that need to be helped within our communities. So 
Yes, um, thank you so much for your time today. Um, are there any questions or is there anything else you'd like to no, say? No, nothing, nothing finish? from me. I think someone did put in the chat, Helen, that um, Lisa said that she works for a children's charity and that the, that poem was extremely powerful. Thank you for sharing. Oh, yes, um, I think I um, the thing is, when you write a poem yourself, I've actually sat on that poem. That's the first time I've shared it. Um, I sat on it because when I wrote it, I realised that it could actually, because it was a real outpouring and we had an amazing session yesterday, last night on the poetry hour. Um, I, I think it was dialect behavioural therapy and then um, the um, organisation, you'll have, have to help me, um, Emma, I can't remember the organisation that does it, but they, they specialise in poetry and they, they talked us through how to write passion poems. Yeah, um, I think I naturally like wrote a passion poem, <laughs> only I, have had, I didn't do the flip side. So I was very aware when I wrote it um, not to share it too far, because at that point in lockdown, I mean, we weren't even really allowed to go out. We could only go out in our gardens. Um, and they're really what everyone was already trying their best. Um, and adjusting and I felt that if I didn't like put it up anywhere that it might have been too upsetting for people um, however I feel things have opened up now and I think now is a real time for looking at how do we start to address some of the things that happened during lockdown and and obviously coming from um, a pediatrics and CAMS background I, I am still very concerned about um, supporting children and families and also our NHS staff and social care staff, social workers that are, are burning out um, with the high demand at the moment. So certainly that's what we're doing at the shed. People can just come. It's very informal. It's very, it, you know, we don't advertise it because we don't need to. <laughs> um, um, people just come and relax and have that space and time um, to recharge. Um, so um, I don't know. Oh, Emma says, well done, West Bank, on your award. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Thank you. <laughs> it was amazing. Thanks so much for that, Helen and Nina.